good to go. Okay, I am I'm also going to go with um, where we're at at the moment in terms of um, sound. I'm in my living room. It is early morning, so hopefully the dogs are not going to bark when the postman turns up. Um, I'm also going to switch it up a little bit of a gear. Um, the the morning uh, for me so far, which will have been the, the previous presentations, have been um, to do with kind of counselling and where we're going and working online. So my background is um, in and around working online, but also the problems that come with online. So this is going to be kind of a, a counter counter argument to what's going on in the, the um, space of uh, online online work at the moment. So first of all, we'll go with who I am. So I'm not very good at this. Um, I'm sure you can all read the slide yourself, um, but my background is in um, working in IT. It's also working in cybersecurity, data protection and engineering, but I'm also a qualified psychotherapist with children and adults specialising in trauma, and that is uh, both virtual and corporeal. So what I'm going to take you through today are some of the issues that we may face as therapists, some of the things we need to consider, and then a little bit of a reflection on what cyber trauma and online harms are. So I come from a position which is biopsychophilosophical, um, and also uh, takes into context uh, social uh, situations. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the, the whole overview. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to start right at the beginning with what is cyber trauma? So some of you may well have come to this uh, talk. You will have seen the word online harms. You will have seen the word cyber trauma. So to give you a little bit of background of this, it's psychological, sexual, emotional, virtual harm. And what this really means at this point in time is within the United Kingdom, we have something called the Online Harms Bill that's going to be put through uh, Parliament and government and actually will produce a way that people can be protected from online harms. However, the Online Harms Bill doesn't necessarily cover everything that we might deal with as a uh, counsellor, psychotherapist, psychologist, but also some of those harms may well be caused by legal um, uh, entities, but also they can be caused by us. So first of all, let's have a look at the cyber trauma definition. It is uh, obviously, it's very academic because this is where this is where it sits at this point in time. But what I'm looking at here is that this is a trauma that can happen via people, machine learning algorithms, uh, machine learning bots. It can happen for us, for our clients now or in the future. And one of the things I want to kind of get into context on this talk is how that can actually happen. Um, the, the idea of this being um, a trauma that can, occur, uh, that can uh, happen on any platform at any time, it can happen on multiple platforms, it can uh, include the way that technology is moving forward, so this is um, including haptic feedback, text, voice, touch, um, there, there's a lot to be considered and the world in which we're all working now means that our clients may well be coming to us with some of these issues. And also we need to be ensuring that we don't cause some of these issues as well. Which is not to say that we are actively trying to do things to um, hurt or harm our clients. Sometimes it's a naivete about our knowledge that can actually lead to these problems. So as of the end of 2019, there were 4.8 billion users of the internet space. So this is 4.8 billion users that were actively uh, measured at, in December. Uh, this figure is going to completely change in the next six to 12 months. And that's not because people will be buying more items or you know computers will be available. It's to do with the fact that right now we have um, Elon Musk's uh, satellites that are orbiting the planet 
uh, which are called Starlink. And once these are turned on, that will make the internet available globally. So as many people as it, uh, there are on the planet will be able to access the internet. So one of the things that I'm gonna do is take you right back to the beginning in terms of what do we need to know for our clients when it comes to understanding what this actually means for them, for us, for human development and where we're actually heading. So one of the things to, to take into mind is when the internet was um, kind of brought to the, the public in 1996, actually it had existed for some time as a, an in-house service within organisations such as CERN. And this in-house service was one that was kept um, for a small number of people and it was to do with the sharing of information within that system. And if we think about human beings, we have intra-psychic processes and inter-psychic processes. We, we work as human beings that exist as a, a complete entity with our own thoughts, feelings, uh, wanderings, musings, and, um, and more. But also then we have this interpersonal relationship. And that interpersonal relationship can actually shape and change the intrapersonal relationship as well. So where we have this metaphor, it, it really does parallel the human being, but also this new space that we all uh, work and operate in. So for a moment, if you consider that our, our space to think, to be, to work with our clients means that we are either working in a face-to-face -face setting or has recently happened, we are, we are now working online. So when we think about the personal development of our clients, it is now imperative that we take into account that there is this other space and place for them and what this actually means for us in terms of working with the person um, that we are facing or listening to or sitting opposite. Um, I'm going to talk about the cyber synapse for a moment, not, not because that's the name of my uh, podcast, but because um, I think going back to Louis Cozzolino, so actually something Neville said about um, the, way that, the way that we interrelate, um, we have synapses between uh, the, space, the neuron spaces in our brain, which are the, the synapses, and Louis Cozzolino writes really eloquently about the fact that we have a social synapse, and this is, this is when we're sitting across from somebody, what Dan, what Dan Siegel might call them we. Um, so this is when we sit with somebody in therapy and we might be having a conversation with them and as they talk to us and we talk to them, there's a space between in which we co-regulate and self-regulate. Given that we now have this space that we are, uh, right now actually, we're, we're in, um, I decided in, in whatever it was, 2014, 2015, that actually this is exactly what's happening with our connectivity. We have a cyber synapse. So everything that we do in this virtual space, in this cyber space, has an impact on us. And that means that we are developing the ability to be able to continue conversations long after we're gone. Um, we can have conversations now that will still be around in the future and we can have conversations now where we look back on the past. And this is the, this is the whole uh, aspect of the foreverness of the internet that I discuss uh, usually when I'm talking about um, my, in my training. Um, but this is one of the things that right now, when we work with our clients, we have to really consider that we aren't just working with a client with a history that's tangible, there's also this virtual space and everything that happens within it. So as therapists, we're no longer bound by geography, uh, you know, disabilities or incarcerations for any of our clients for the provision of psychotherapy. So where we're going as a, um, a profession means that we can now work with people that we were previously limited to 
And of course, this is absolutely apparent in terms of COVID. So what about COVID, the lockdown, the fact that we are working from home or living at work um, as, the, as the memes would have us believe? So right at the beginning of the first lockdown, um, I do spend a lot of time on social media forums. I do spend a lot of time on social media, um, mainly because that's my research area and I, I tend to see a lot of what's going on. And in 2018, I put together a company called uh, Privacy4. And this company was put together to educate and provide information for therapists working online around cybersecurity data protection and privacy laws. And the reason I did this is because within the UK, um, we are bound by the Data Protection Act 2018, which includes the European uh, law, the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Ruling. And of course, this didn't just affect us within uh, the United Kingdom or the EU. It's worldwide for anybody who's processing that means doing something with data of any residents within those countries hey, baby. and of course of course we're in a we're in a space and place where some of this landscape is still continually shifting and changing and one of the things that i noticed right at the beginning of lockdown were many people in the psychotherapy um, and counseling world weren't necessarily in a space where they knew how to work online. So one of the things that we, we have is appropriate training. So of course, Renee's company provides training, um, ACTO approved provider, providers, sorry, within the United Kingdom provide training. And yet what happened was we had a forced hand and a new way of working for many people. But of course, this cyberspace is unknown in terms of the training uh, that many people get. And by that, I mean, it's unknown as to things that can go wrong. So what I was actually seeing on social media were phrases like, well, what, what can go wrong, Cass? All I'm doing is using Zoom or FaceTime or uh, WhatsApp. And one of the things that I am now witnessing as um, the, the director of Privacy 4 is many clients have actually been jeopardized in terms of their data, which is another word for information, through a lack of knowledge. So what is the worst that could happen? Well, we know that cyber criminals exist. They've existed ever since the intranet um, existed because it was a way for people to establish competition. It was a way for people to be able to access something that somebody else had fairly similar to a burglar. And one of the things that, that happened in uh, obviously 1996 is we got the World Wide Web. And that then meant that cyber criminals of any age description or background could try and hack into or disrupt or change something on somebody else's website or forum, basically because they could. But then came the monetary gain. And one of the things to bear in mind with uh, cyber criminality is it's much easier to create a situation where they can take small amounts of money rather than be picked up or noticed by um, any kind of authority for trying to take large amounts. And one of the things that we are fairly competent with noticing are um, what we call phishing attacks. So one of the things to bear in mind is during COVID, there was an increase in um, cybercrime. So in here in the uh, United Kingdom, we have the National Crime Agency's uh, cyber division called Action Fraud. And action fraud are there to monitor, measure and really investigate complaints about cyber related malicious attacks. What did happen was in March, between the 17th of March and the end of March, there was a 400% increase in cyber criminal attacks. 
Recently, I attended a cybersecurity conference um, in October. And again, these stats are um, they're, they're fairly, fairly stable, you know, between 400 and 500 percent. But what we don't know to this date is exactly what is happening in terms of um, what the cyber criminals have hold of, when when they got hold of it, where they got hold of it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because many people don't have within their training um, knowledge about what to do should they receive an attack. Um, during lockdown itself, um, between March and October. I received uh, three phone calls from therapists who'd received malicious attacks and uh, uh, viruses. Somebody was scammed for their bank details. And I worked with a number of clients who were referred from cyber helplines. The reason cyber criminals are so proficient and, 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 and so prevalent at this point in time is because data is the new oil. And what I mean by that is any information is worth something if you can resell it. So there is a way to actually find out what your, what your worth is in terms of personal data. And I can tell you that I am worth to a criminal 0.156 US dollars. That is how much they would have to pay another um, cyber criminal to get my personal information. And that's based on things that I do in the public domain. So for example, um, shopping on Amazon or eBay or I don't know, um, supermarkets, shopping on, well, for me, it's bookstores, things, things like that, that there are already traceable and trackable um, aspects to my online presence and to date, I am worth 0.156 um, US dollars. What's interesting is the more information they can get from you, the cheaper it becomes because that data can be sold and resold and resold. And the thing about data is it isn't like the, um, the physical money that you hand over to a shopkeeper. It's, it's something that can be sold and resold and resold again which actually puts us at risk of things happening to us from the cyber criminals repeatedly. And this takes me back to that cyber, cyber trauma definition about that this, this can be a repeated, ongoing, delayed um, kind of trauma, and it can include retrospective information. So imagine that as a psychotherapist, you have a computer that you haven't protected because you didn't know how to, um, that that might just put some of your internet browsing history at risk. It might put your emails at risk. It might put your bank account at risk. And to date, um, one of the things that is really, really quite prevalent is cybersecurity is not taught as any part of um, a counselling and psychotherapy course to date in terms of what it is that we need to know. Because when counselling and psychotherapy courses were, were originally designed, if you like, in the 1950s, all the way through to date, many of us didn't need to contemplate this digital space. And even so, the digital space that we work in as online therapists is quite low in numbers in terms of those that have been through appropriate training. And even during lockdown, much of the... Uh, much of the presentation in this country was provision first, safety second. And under the Data Protection Act, um, it's the other way around. And considering that one is a law, um, the other is guidance, you can see that we've got into a bit of a pickle. So what does this mean for us and for our clients? And this is worldwide. Whose data is at risk from those hacks, breaches or improper use? Uh, we may not know for some time. And to give you an example of what, what I mean by this, recently there was a news article about the hack that took place with the um, Helsinki uh, counselling practice and 40,000 patient records were accessed. Now, what was discussed was the fact that the, the clinic offered the, the clients uh, one session of therapy and they also said, you know, where the cyber criminals are blackmailing you for 
dollars, which isn't really that larger amount of money. Um, we're asking you not to pay it. Um, but what has come out in terms of the reports and through um, cybersecurity professionals uh, looking into this is these hacks took place before March 2019. And many of these records and many of these clients um, actually were in the clinic 2018 to 2019. So this information has been held by the, by the cyber criminals even for already nearly two years before being used as a blackmailing um, issue. So as psychotherapists and counsellors, my question would be, what do you know about cybersecurity? What do you know about protecting your own computer for number one, your own, uh, your own protection in terms of your, your own internet history, your own banks? But secondly, how do we protect our clients' information to ensure that we don't then end up with what, what's called a data breach? Because what that could result in is a knock at your door from uh, or, or a, a phone call or an email from your client saying what the blinking heck has happened. I've just received um, uh, an email from a cyber criminal saying that they have hold of my notes. Um, I thought you told me that you you provided me with a safe space that I could come and talk to you about anything. And obviously I've shared with you all of my traumas, desires, um, abuse history, you know, fetishes, likes, dislikes, conversations about what I think about my uh, family, et cetera, et cetera. And how, how would we feel if that happened? Now, I'm fully aware that this is a really scary space, place and conversation to be having. Um, I, I don't sell this lightly. Um, so one of the things to bear in mind is this is why to, to, in, in 2020, all online therapy training needs to include data protection, privacy and cybersecurity. It, it's mandatory in terms of what we need to be able to do because we need to know how to make sure that we don't, um, we don't allow our uh, virtual room to be um, contravened in the same way that we would do it with a physical room. So for example, when we work in the corporeal world, we protect our space with our client. We ensure that the door is locked. We ensure that the uh, the windows can't be seen through. We know that we've got a room that's possibly at the end of the corridor, or we quieten our voice down if there are people wandering around outside. You know, we, we have these ways and means of knowing that we're keeping our clients safe. And when it comes to the virtual space at this point in time, it's still not fully understood um, in terms of a, an introjection and a, um, an embodied way of being, how we do that virtually. So when it comes to working with clients, particularly in an environment where we are all um, working in and around a collective trauma, one of the things we have to bear in mind is that the way in which we present and our clients um, comes under something that is taught. So many online training courses cover the online disinhibition and these relationships are different in, in terms of to face-to-face, to -face, -face, the corporeal. But what does this mean in terms of therapeutic alliance? What does this mean in terms of working with a client who is traumatized? Now, I know that Pip's going to do the therapeutic alliance. I'm, I'm really interested in what happens when we work with somebody who is traumatized. So... During lockdown, I saw um, a number of conferences and interviews with um, Bessel van der Kolk, Stephen Porges, um, a number of people who are very well-known names in the uh, landscape of trauma. Unfortunately, um, flippant comments such as just turn the camera off are not necessarily trauma informed when it comes to video work. And that's because we have to take more into account than this online disinhibition effect, we have to understand all of the other issues that a traumatized person may face when they are in and around technology. So when I send this presentation through, um, you, can, you can obviously click on the link, but I did a, uh, a very short video, I think it's about 
20 minutes about trauma-informed video work and why we need to take into account people who might suffer with um, disassociation, who might have body dysmorphia, who might actually find um, trauma trauma related issues entirely scary. So for uh, uh, to give you an example on that, um, children who have been sexually abused will have had their sexual abuser look at them. And you can imagine that being sit being sat stood in front of a, a camera where your therapist is front and center and absolutely huge on that that video is extremely intrusive and a, a client may not be able to do as Stephen Porges and Bessel van der Kolk suggest, which is just to turn the camera off. They may not have enough agency or autonomy to even ask you to do it. So you can see that in their safe space, their home, you may be intruding into that space. And of course, many of us who work online provide that space with the, with the caveat that it's safe but that may not necessarily be true for our clients. So we, we have to consider a lot more than just the provision of using um, videos. So um, hopefully it will be out soon, but there is also, um, I have a, a journal article under peer review at the moment, talking about what happened in, in lockdown from a therapist perspective and how many of us rushed to work in, in this domain and many of us rush to work with this uh, new technology without fully understanding those uh, issues that are faced by our clients such like the uh, online disinhibition effect which I'm going to come to in just a second but also trauma-informed video work and considering that court processes now take place online um, for children who have been sexually abused um, abuse victims, violence victims. Uh, it, the, there's a lot to be said about what we did as a as a collective in terms of providing services online without taking into account the impact on the person on the other side, or indeed what it would be like for us. So, <clears throat> one of the things to bear in mind is when we are in this digital space, um, we all have vulnerabilities. So I'm going to take you into kind of the, the, the theory, philosophy around cyber trauma and some of the things for us to, to understand so that these conversations um, can happen on Thursday. I'm sure that there may well be many questions about cybersecurity, privacy and so on that arrive on um, Thursday as well. So for me, vulnerability when it comes to digital media is both a noun and a verb. There are classifications um, within uh, policies in the United Kingdom for people who are classified as vulnerable, and they might be children in the looked after system, children with special education needs, uh, and that includes adults as well. However, anybody using digital media is also vulnerable by the very fact that you are open to any kind of cyber attack. So this is, this is both a, a, a noun and a verb as, as far as I'm concerned. We also have to take into account uh, trust versus safety in the uh, in the virtual space. And by this, this is where I'm really going to suggest that um, the online disinhibition is uh, effect is insufficient. And I'm going to come to that very shortly. So just to change um, the pace and direction of this uh, lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about how and why we interact with uh, technology in the way that we do. So obviously many of us um, have done pretty much training around um, who we are as human beings and we learn that we uh, separate from the other person along the continuum of our development, something that's known as de-individuation. Um, it depends on whether you're using object relations theory. Um, the theory doesn't really matter at this stage what I'm gonna say is that infants are born with an innate desire to connect, bond and attach. What's, what's really important for my theory and the way that I talk about cyber trauma and online behaviors and you know human development in a digital world, um, this happens through um, interpersonal re uh, relationships, uh, relational safety, proximity, 
eye contact and somatics. That means bodily contact. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take you very quickly through the background of um, what I'm what I'm positing here, really. So Stephen Porges uh, brought together something called the polyvagal theory, and it has become uh, basically this is the new buzzword on the street. Um, I'm seeing lots and lots of people talking about how to create vagal tone um, and why we need to understand uh, new, new, new areas that um, Stephen Porges actually hasn't uh, uh, hasn't been able to back up in terms of his own theory. So the polyvagal theory has been extended by the public and Stephen Porges, I believe, is writing another book at the moment um, in order to to address some of this. Um, so at the moment, I see a lot on social media about this fawning response and um, Stephen Porges didn't originally say this, but you know that that's where we're going. And that's one of the things that happens obviously with social media. So to talk about why neuroception is important in terms of working online and working with digital spaces and why we get into the pickles that we do online, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of background in terms of when I'm uh, teaching around uh, why we do the things that we do online. So polyvagal theory is all about um, threat versus safety. OK, it's about how your nervous system feels in the world and whether we have something called relational safety. Neuroception and the way that we um, kind of make sense of our environment is through this, uh, funnily enough, to use a computing term, Wi-Fi of the nervous system. It picks up on the energy uh, around us and 80 percent of those messages that the nervous system collects. So this is the central nervous system are sensed by the the. Uh, nervous system they go all the way up through the bottom end of the brain um, through an area called the cerebellum and uh, the, the diencephalon as well and it's in that area that those messages are interpreted as to whether there's safety or threat and whether we need to mobilize to safety withdraw and shut down or whether we can have a balanced um, balanced view so in order for us to be able to have a conversation to engage relationally, we we need this system to be online. We need um, we need our bodies to feel safe. And of course, when we're sitting in and around um, devices, we're usually in a safe space. You know, for example, in our uh, homes, in our offices, in our bedrooms, wherever it is that our clients might be, and wherever we might be, and our bodies believe, and I'm, I'm giving it a somatic uh, address here, our bodies believe that we are in a safe space. However, that may not necessarily be true in terms of what happens on the screen in front of us. Um, we are looking at faces and one of the things, mostly, you know, unless we're doing uh, telephone contact or instant messaging, but we are looking at faces or we are imagining faces in those, those latter two examples. And obviously, Dan Siegel talks about having a coherent um, brain and body so that we can have a, a, a mind that works together with the other person that we are speaking with. Now, one of the things to say um, in terms of why this happens is if I could just go back to this image. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, particularly, uh, I'm going to say proud of, one of the things that I'm uh, uh, positing it's it's coming out in a book this year it's already out in a, another chapter I've done in a book um, about compassion in cyberspace is we tend to stand sit or hold our devices at this distance this distance here between mother and baby the innate eye gaze um, that happens when babies are born and that's somewhere between 30 to 40 centimeters so I went back to the ophthalmic uh, ophthalmology literature and found that many people who have um, issues with their eyes uh, tend to sit either closer or further away from from their uh, devices and actually it's becoming uh, a well-known um, eye related issue for people who sit too close to their their screens etc in terms of eye strain and what's happening there but I'm actually classing this as the uh, zone of zone of false safety and the reason I call it the false safety is 
Babies naturally feel safe when they are close to a n other in their infancy. They imprint a, uh, let's call it, a somatic feeling of what it is to be safe. And that safety distance is around about 30 to 40 centimetres um, when they're with their primary caregiver. And obviously when we sit with our devices, we tend to sit at that distance. And I'm suggesting that our biology is tricked into feeling uh, safe. And in doing so, this then produces some of the reasons why we get into the pickles that we do with technology and cyberspace. We've also got to take into account the attachment styles that um, we are working with, whether it be ours or those of our clients. And that's to say that one of the things we need to take into account is attachment styles are also changing. That's another um, proposition I'm making and another, another journal article. Um, and this is to do with something, something called the Dunbar effect. So the Dunbar effect is the number of relationships that we can hold in mind at any one time. And this tends to max out around about 150, which according to the Dunbar effect is also around about the, the number that you would find in a hunter-gatherer tribe um, or a small village. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we go back to something that I said right at the beginning of this uh, presentation, that was 4.8 billion people at the end of 2019 that we could potentially be in contact with at any one time. If that now increases to the the uh, a larger number, somewhere in in the region of seven to eight billion people who now switch on devices because obviously the demonetization um, of technology is, is becoming more and more prevalent, you know, in terms of Moore's law, um, we will find that there is a new level of pressure for young people and probably ourselves to have the perfect profile picture on social media. And also what that might mean in terms of who we can contact, how we can contact them, when we can be contacted and, and more and more and more. Obviously, I'll leave that to your imagination and speculation. Um, I talk more about that in uh, presentations that I give around um, online behaviours and what's, what's actually happening with young people. So going back to this online disinhibition effect, um, I'm also suggesting it's insufficient because of the issues here, which the online disinhibition effect talks about um, a, uh, a spectrum of benign versus toxic, and then it also has factors which are also polemic. And, um, you know, they, this, this now starts to make this a very, very complicated area of human behaviour online. But much of this here is cognitive in its, um, in its origin. Um, so the idea of imagination, um, thinking about authority, the idea that we can't be tracked, um, uh, uh, solipsistic interjection in terms of who we think we know online. All of these are cognitive um, and affect, well, they're, they're mainly cognitive affect um, based. What they don't take into account is that biological imprinting that I've talked about. And they don't, they don't take into account why we might be subjected to issues online because of the distance at which we're sitting. So take, for example, if you are holding your device and you're scrolling down whatever social media platform it is and you come across a video that you were not prepared for. The impact of that uh, viewing, that witnessing may well be much, much more deeper because you didn't have those biological um, warnings. What, what I tend to teach children is the uh oh feeling. So this is where the polyvagal um, neuroception comes into being really, really important about this in the background. So just to go slightly off kilter again and talk um, mainly about what we might be working with, what's happening in terms of online um, around children. Um, we're going to come on to this screen time and mental health. Um, I might just leave this slide for a second because I'm going to I'm going to really come back to this screen time in just a second. 
But right now we have a mental health crisis uh, globally. Um, and this has been reported that many people are struggling with the lack of interactions. And I particularly dislike the term uh, socially distance. I think it's physically distance. We're not, we're not socially distanced, mainly because we can contact people in, in lots of different ways and still socialize virtually. But we can also, um, particularly in the UK, go and meet people in the outdoor area. Um, I think the term socially distance um, really didn't give kudos to what it was that was happening, but what it did do was it increased the amount of fear. And here's one of the things that we've got with the collective trauma is the mental health uh, issue and that uh, interjection and understanding of what it means to be socially distanced. Um, I think language is really, really important. And to be perfectly honest, I think the government's uh, completely got it wrong when they started using this phrase. However, we've got what we've got. Um, and of course, spending time near devices, on devices, um, increases the chances of those cyber traumas happening. Um, it also increases the knowledge that you are distanced physically from your loved ones if you can't actually go and see them. And of course, for people who were incarcerated in hospitals, um, people who were going to the hospitals that were pregnant and weren't able to take their partners you know this really really has increased the collective trauma that we're all we're all facing at this point in time we also have the issues of social media and gaming um i'm going to be very very brief on this one because it's an entire it's nearly an entire day um taking to pieces the the research that's out there at the moment and those documentary dramas that are more drama than documentary, more drama than actual robust evidence. Um, and it's interesting that um, social media has actually allowed many of the young people to retain many of those connections and prevent them having uh, mental health issues. Gaming, which was given by the ICD-11, we now have the uh, disorder of uh, gaming disorder, which again, I don't think is a real thing. Um, there's a lot of politics that went into that actual diagnosis and I'm not gonna go into it here, but gaming is also a space and place where children and young people have socialized. And that has also prevented a major impact of mental health. Um, <clears throat> what I would say about both of these issues is beware the data analysis. Um, if you read many of the reports around these issues, you will see that they are skewed um, statistical tests that have been used. Um, the reporting tends to be by the mainstream media who are cherry picking and using the, the negativity bias to sell um, many of their products, as have some of those drama documentaries. So when we're working with clients or ourselves, one of the things to bear in mind around screens and this term screen time is it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Um, it can't be measured. Uh, there's no such thing as being able to describe what kind of screen it is, um, whether it's something that affects our clients. They might be passively or actively engaged with something. Also, um, they might be doing homework. They might be using uh, Word or Excel, um, uh, or they might be gaming or using social media for, uh, closing the title, socializing. Um, there's so many other factors at play about, um, for example, if it's a young carer, are they actually using the screen as a, a, a or, or social media, if you like, through a screen to socialize? Um, and one of the things I would say is these devices are both a medium and a tool, and we can't measure those two variables at the same time in the same way. There is no research that will ever show the causality for screen time. And of course, <clears throat> excuse me, I've read lots and lots of research uh, and, and articles in um, papers showing that screen time is affecting language development. And I'm not saying that there isn't an issue with devices being in and around relationships for our clients. It's how we measure it, what we measure, what's classified as uh, excessive for one family, and also it's really interesting that before social media, I didn't actually see a diagnosis of um, uh, screen time or excessive um, Excel spread use by anybody in a workplace. 
So it's interesting that this screen time debate only popped up when social media existed um, and it didn't actually include anybody who had been using a computer since perhaps 1984 work purposes. One of the things to bear in mind when we are working with our clients um, are it's what they do online. It's what they do, where they go, um, and how how this how this actually affects what they're doing or bringing to you in terms of um, any issues. So one of the things around uh, UK Kids Online, uh, sorry EU Kids Online and uh, UKIS, which is the uh, Child Internet Safety Organisation, um, and even within the eSafety Organisation that I'm a part of, is we've got to be looking at what are the, the risks or dangers and whether they are um, classified for each age group, whether it's for a particular client. And this is to consider, you know, whereabouts they go, who they talk to. Um, so this might be content, content. So that's what are they viewing? Context, how, what, where are they uh, viewing it? Contact from anybody uh, in terms of, is it a uh, perpetrator of crimes against children? Um, conduct, how are they behaving online or how is a person behaving online towards them? And then obviously this exposure time, did they stay on a website where there were um, uh, graphic videos or indeed did they come off social media straight away? It's, it's really an N equals one process. And also we have to bear in mind that many of the TV programmes that are available 24-7 um, also have different age ratings and also many of us are now uh, talking about Netflix, using Netflix and there are programmes on there that were designed uh, with young people in mind um, but actually are or would be um, considered inappropriate if you actually take into account some of the um, images and the content that's uh, within those programmes. For example, Netflix, on Netflix, there was a programme called 13 Reasons Why. It ran for three seasons. In season one, there was a scene at the end where a young girl um, took her own life. Um, and that scene uh, was very graphic. It was then removed after some complaints from parents. However, in series two, the highly graphic uh, sexual assault scene wasn't removed. and um you know given given that it didn't leave much to the imagination why was a suicide scene removed but not a sexual assault um so you can see that we have massive inconsistencies in terms of the content that children might be coming across or adults might be coming across and in terms of what that means for us working with any of those cyber traumas again it's an n equals one what somebody finds distressing may not be found distressing by you or by somebody else So when we consider working online <clears throat> and we take into account um, the cyber traumas, the fact that we might be facing some of these things, the fact that we're in a collective trauma, one of the things to, to consider is what theoretical literature do you draw on? Um, I'm going to suggest that we, we now need new theories because there are, there are issues with, um, let's go with grief theory. So many of us will study grief or, and death and you will study uh, uh, Kubler-Ross. You will look at the, um, the tasks of grief. It depends on um, what, what perspective you're training under. But all of those theories were developed before the internet. So death was finite. How is it for a young person or for an adult to now be in contact with um, repeated uh, social media posts from people who have died. Um, the fact that, you know, for example, Facebook, and I'm, I'm, I'm only picking on Facebook here because many of us use it and can go with the example, that it will give you time related uh, memories. It may show you pictures, it may show you statuses. Um, it will also tell you about a, a birthday and, and, and these might be people who are already deceased. Um, you can go onto your Xbox, your PS4, um, or PS5 as it is now. You can go into gaming uh, worlds, you can go onto forums and still find the virtual avatar of the person who is deceased. 
there are now companies who are taking uh, images from uh, photographs to create an avatar in virtual reality that somebody can go and visit. So you can actually go and physically visit, if you like, virtually, um, a deceased person. So where, where we're moving forward to in, in terms of our work as online therapists, what literature are you drawing on if that literature hasn't been written about the kinds of issues that our clients are going to be facing? Um, to date, this is unlike any other phenomena that exists. There are consistently two worlds. So you have the virtual and the corporeal. So you have your, uh, well, there's virtual and virtual in, in, in a sense, because you have the virtual, i.e. your own memory, and the virtual, which is readable, clickable, downloadable, uploadable, um, watchable, uh, rewindable, uh, fast forwardable, whatever it is, you've got these two separate spaces that you constantly need to keep in, in hand at any one time. And then what are the interventions you draw from if there's no literature and a paradigm in which to do so? So I'm actually a gaming therapist. I use computer games. Um, I've studied this, written about this. It's on my podcast. Um, I use uh, computer games because they give me much more scope to work with my clients in terms of interventions than real life situations do but also those real life uh, situations can be seen in a similar way or metaphor to the game um, so I'll give you an example that this this last week I was talking to a client about a difficulty he was facing in the world and I asked him to pick a figure from a game that we talk about more often than not and he chose Kratos from God of War. And what we did was we looked at the similarities, differences, parallels of Kratos versus his life. And then what we did was we changed the outcome of the game. We, we talked about the game um, God of War. <clears throat> we looked at different choices. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, this client could metaphorically third person take what was happening to Kratos, put that into his real life situation. And of course, the first chance we get when we go back into the therapy room is to go back in and, and really discuss and play uh, God of War and see why, why the difficulties might be arising for this client. So what does the future of psychotherapy look like as I'm starting to bring you towards um, the, the end of the presentation? Well, number one, I would suggest you have a read of um, the, the books that are by Kotler and Diamandis. There's actually three of them. Uh, the future is faster than you think was brought out at the beginning of this year. I'm suggesting that we are heading towards a landscape that looks very similar to Ready Player One. Um, we are certainly changing the way technology is and works. Um, and some time ago, I, I used to be uh, the director at ACTO for research and development. But because I'm so busy doing my PhD and book, um, which will be out next year and journal article, I just didn't have time for it. But. I can tell you the future of psychotherapy is changing in terms of working online, working virtually, working augmented, augmented reality wise. Um, and there's a lot to be said about where, where we are heading. <clears throat> the thing to bear in mind is, you know, right now the future is unknown, but it is scientific, it's factional, um, and it's based in those choices we don't yet know we need to make. And, and that will happen within the next five, 10, 15 years. And I am really looking forward to coming back to uh, presentations like this that I did in 15 years time to see what it is that I thought was gonna happen and then what actually happened. Um, but as therapists, we do need to take into account the ethics um, uh, and our morals around what's happening, what we do online, what we do, and, and I use the term online because most of us here use that term, young people don't, they, they just have this other space. Um, but also we need to think about the compassion that we have for people um, and how we see our role in this, in this space. And of course, one of the things we always need to do is be able to safeguard in terms of remotely, Currently to date, there is no, um, there's no policies or um, literature or interventions or indeed um, books or guides on this. However, 
I'm in the process of creating one to come out very soon for us to be able to work with our clients and potentially ask them the questions to find out if there are safeguarding issues or, uh, of course, cyber trauma issues. And that, Renee, brings me to the end of the presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Kath. Amazing, amazing. There's a couple of people who had to leave early. Um, that's absolutely amazing. Um, yes, uh, Kath, um, wow. So I want to just leave uh, like um, with a couple of questions or time for questions. Does mm -hmm. anyone have any questions for, for Kath? I can tell you, Renee, one of the things that happens by the time I've done one of these presentations is usually stunned silence for a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So Margaret, uh, Margaret just said, you've opened her eyes and scared her a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's a brand new, yeah, it's a brand new landscape. And of course, of course, it's scary. We've never, we've never been here in inverted commas. And if you think about, um, if I said to you, get on a plane, obviously not at this point in time, unless you're wearing a mask and it, it, you know, that in itself is scary, but you know, let's take COVID off the, off the table for a moment. If I said to you, right, go and go and live in this country for six months, many of us would be terrified. We wouldn't know what to do. We wouldn't have the tools. Um, we wouldn't have the language. You know, this is why I'm, I'm really, I don't like those terms like digital immigrant and digital native. I just think there's actually, there's, it's a new space and we've got to learn the language. We've got to learn the risks. We've got to learn the dangers. Pretty much we're all growing up again. Mm. Yep. Okay. One question um, from Rodney. How much of cybersecurity relies <clears throat> on security in where they are hosting their websites? I'm not actually sure what you mean by that, Rodney. Because um, Rodney actually works, um, actually does a bit of cybersecurity himself. So I think that's also interesting to share. Um, I think probably he's asking almost for and on behalf of all the therapists here that how secure are the websites that we run just generally on the internet? It, well, that would depend on the hosting platform. So, for example, if you're using WordPress, WordPress was um, uh, that was picked on during COVID by the cyber criminals. There was a lot of interesting. Um, yeah, Word, WordPress was hacked by a lot of uh, cyber criminals. So, WordPress themselves then came out and um, put some major interventions on. Um, uh, yeah, psychology today. Well, actually, this is really interesting, and it starts taking us into that um, data protection world. Um, most websites uh, in the UK that follow GDPR also implement something called ISO 27001. Now, that's an international standard, okay? Yeah. Um, that, that means that it isn't necessarily just about the hosting website. It's also about how they've implemented every single layer of security because it's 27001, mm. 27002. There's lots and lots of extra layers. And one of the things we do as therapists is pretty much what our clients do with us. We implicitly go to a platform and expect that we can put our trust in their cybersecurity. Uh, mm. um, um, what's the word I want here? Factors. So if, for example, if I go to my bank, I am confident that they will have um, things in place that protect me as their customer. And that might include, yeah. uh, you know, two factor authentication. Councillors don't talk like this. This is what this is what I've noticed over the last uh, you know decade or so. Councillors just don't understand this landscape of uh, mm. conversation. And when we talk about consent it, in in the GDPR, it gets confused with consent about the process of therapy. Yep. Um, and what what we're not taught at this point in time is this is how to check a website security. Does it have HTTPS? Does it yep. have you know, what we call a, um, a certain security certificates. Does it have, most of us just go, oh, great, it's a directory, I will sign up. And mm. I've actually challenged some of the, um, some of the directories that exist within this country and elsewhere. They are, um, they're not protecting data when it leaves them. So, mm -hmm. you know, our data on that platform might well be protected, but the clients isn't. 
therapists are not taught how to um, uh, send information securely, keep it securely, mm -hmm. what encryption and password protection differences are. And then, of course, if they've then got to go and um, generalize that to anything in the, the uh, you know, online, they don't know what they're looking for. So more often than not, they will go to a, a website hosting platform that was advertised on television. Yep. Oh, I went to this platform and, you know, I have come across uh, when I first started with a website, I went to a company. It was an absolute nightmare. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, and as a result, I came away from that. And, you know, we got into a bit of a, a debate about whether I was actually going to pay them for the 12 months um, uh, contract. And I actually said you didn't deliver you didn't deliver the service because you weren't as secure as you said you were on on the advertisement. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea of encrypt, as, as Rodney saying, encrypted servers, dedicated IPs. Also, the other thing that many people don't understand right at this point in time, in terms of COVID lockdown, we're all working from home, which means our internet service providers need to be pretty good at what they're doing. Yes. Plus computer, plus yes. website, plus yes. the traffic coming in and out, yes. and it just scares a lot of people. It scares a lot of people in terms of the amount of information that we need to take in. Yes. Yeah subsequent to training in how to talk because yep. that's what we painted it was as therapists yeah we learn how to talk to our client we learn how to have a safe relationship interpersonal yep. provide relational safety and then we yep. go online and not one of you knows who's behind my webcam at the moment you can't see the rest of my room you don't sure. know yeah yeah absolutely and the idea of intrusions into that space and what's considered secure safe Yep. versus the cybersecurity version of secure and safe are yep. confusing, confusing for a lot of people. That's the kind of thing that I talk about in my training as well. Yeah, absolutely. That kind of stuff, absolutely. But but all the other stuff, I, you, you you got me there on a lot of different places, but that's why I love you, Kath. And I feel like we've got to wrap it yep. up there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you to all the people who stayed right to the bitter end. We're back again at six o'clock tomorrow. And um, yeah, uh, thanks, Rodney, for your questions because I think it's very <laughs> not bitter. End. Okay, yes. Um, thank you, Rodney. Um, and thanks uh, for everyone who attended today. Um, and now I'm just going to um, uh, click stop recording. Um, but